Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Thursday, January 7th. We are joined today by Yukon Premier, the Honourable Sandy Silver, the Minister of Health and Social Services, the Honourable Pauline Frost, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Once again, our sign language interpreter Mary Thiessen and André Bossier from French Language Services Directorate are with us today. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name and you will each have two questions. Before we begin with our speakers, I would like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having problems, please email ecoinfo at gov.yk.ca. Premier Silver. Thank you very much, Pat. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun and the Ta'anquachin Council. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with Minister Frost and Dr. Hanley on our first update of the new year. So, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, after a long and challenging year, I, I know that uh, Yukoners are filled with hope for 2021. Even though the uh, World Juniors might not have gone our way, uh, I will say, though, a silver medal is an absolute great accomplishment, and I know that the entire territory is incredibly proud of Dylan Cousins for being Canada's top point scorer and making such an amazing impact on a national stage. We wish Dylan and uh, his family the best of luck as he joins the, uh, the Buffalo Sabres uh, training camp and uh, hopes of playing in the NHL uh, this year. Uh, Dylan isn't the only Yukoner that is making uh, his mark or their mark on the international stage. Uh, Yukon Steve Kosmaniak uh, has also been nominated for several Grammy Awards uh, for his work with uh, Dua Lipa. Uh, the award ceremony has been delayed, but uh, we are hoping the best for Stephen uh, when uh, those awards get handed out. This is not uh, Stephen's first time on that stage. Uh, he already won a Grammy uh, back in 2016 for his work with Kendrick Lamar. Uh, I've known Stephen for quite a while, uh, back in the high school days, uh, when he was really starting to hone in on his musical skills, and uh, it's so great to see him uh, flourish to see a Yukoner on the national stage like that. Uh, the Grammys are amongst the highest accomplishment uh, anyone in the music uh, business can receive. I congratulate Stephen uh, for once again being nominated. Both Stephen and Dylan are fantastic examples of Yukoners who have pursued their dreams uh, and developed their skills to a world-class level, and we couldn't be prouder of the both of you. Uh, so back on to vaccines. Uh, the arrival of the vaccines uh, a, a little bit more than a week ago is very good news for our territory, uh, but we cannot forget that we are still in the grips of a pandemic and that there is still a long road ahead of us. Since January 1st, uh, we, uh, we announced several new cases of COVID-19, all of which have been related to travel. Uh, contact tracing is underway, and I know that Dr. Hanley will have uh, more details to share in a moment on that. Uh, the appearance of more cases in our territory is not, un it's not unexpected, but it is a clear reminder that we need to continue to follow public health guidelines and restrictions. We all have a role to play in keeping our territory healthy and safe, and I will repeat myself as I do many times. The best things that Yukoners can do to prevent the virus from spreading is to practice the safe six. Wash your hands office, uh, often, uh, maintain physical distancing, staying at home if you're sick, traveling respectfully and responsibly, self-isolated as required, and following the guidelines, the gathering guidelines that are in place, including limiting indoor gatherings to 10 people. I know that I sound like a broken record, but please continue to practice the safe six plus one. Mask up when you're in the public. There's no excuse for not following these precautions. Some of the recent contact tracing has shown that people are not following the guidelines. We have issued five new charges under the Civil Emergency Measures Act over the last two weeks. Three of these are for failure to self-isolate, one is for failure to abide by the individual declaration upon entering the territory, and one is for failure to wear a mask. It is disappointing to see some people are not taking the situation seriously, and we will continue to follow up on complaints as we receive them. So if you do have concerns, please call the enforcement line at 1-877-377-377. 0425 or email COVID 19 enforcement at gov.yk.ca. 
Yukoners, I must stress once again, we are not out of the woods. COVID-19 is still a risk, and each and every one of us must do all that we can to reduce the spread of this virus. We need to increase our vigilance and make sure that we are taking every precaution to keep our territory safe. A lot has happened since our last update two weeks ago. The Moderna vaccine was approved by Health Canada two days before Christmas. Along with approval, Health Canada also provided detailed guidance on how to safely store, handle, transport, and administer this brand of new vaccine. Health staff, they uh, then started receiving training based upon this information. We want to ensure that we proceed as safely as possible as we roll out this vaccine. We received our first shipment uh, of the vaccine last week, 7,200 uh, doses arrived by plane. I can't tell you how excited uh, Minister Frost, Minister Stryker and I and the folks from EMS and uh, the RCMP were to see the plane landing with the first, uh, first shipments of the vaccines. I want to thank the dedicated team of officials who are working behind the scenes, who've been continuing to work behind the scenes throughout the holidays uh, to ensure the delivery was successful. Finally this week, our long-term care residents and staff began to, uh, to get immunized uh, within days of the shipment arriving. I want to thank Agnes Mills, Mary Merchant, and also June uh, uh, Carpina for volunteering to go ahead and be first and to share their reasons why they thought getting immunized was so important. I think it's really important to hear uh, from people why they're choosing to get the vaccine. And when it's my turn, and I can't wait for that day, I will get immunized uh, to keep my community safe. And because this, the vaccine works best, uh, if we all try to our best to reach herd immunity. For me, it's very similar as to why I wear a mask. I do it to protect those around me. I think it's only fitting that our elders are first uh, here and showing uh, leadership uh, in the, uh, the fight against COVID. Uh, especially as uh, Pauline will tell you, these two individuals have, have shown, their, their, uh, uh, shown their spirit in the past as well, that's for sure. Um, I also want to thank all of the health of officials who have been working tirelessly over the last 10 months and who are still working hard to make the vaccine available for Yukoners. Uh, now, Minister Frost will have more to share uh, about our vaccine rollout uh, this week and uh, what to expect for the upcoming weeks. We expect additional shipments of vaccine doses will arrive in the coming weeks, and we remain committed to have enough vaccines to, vaccin to vaccinate 75% of, of uh, adult Yukoners by the end of March. I want to once again thank all of those involved in the rollout from the logistics to storing to training and planning, uh, communication, uh, all that information, all that communication to Yukoners and to our partners across the territory. This is a whole team that is involved, Team Yukon, and we are all working together towards the exact same goal, to support and protect Yukoners through these challenging times. We are all in this together and together we will get through this. We all have a role to play in minimizing the spread of COVID-19 in our territory. We also each have a role to play in minimizing the spread of misinformation. It's vital to be properly informed of what is happening in our territory and what we can do individually to keep Yukoners safe. I want again to address rumors in the territory. Rumors spread quickly. Uh, and they can cause unnecessary panic, distrust, and resentment. This is not what we need, and it does not help us keep each other safe. I encourage all Yukoners to stay informed uh, about COVID-19 and to get the most accurate, up-to-date information about Yukon's current situation. It's available at yukon.ca. This is where you're going to find out about active cases and risk, if any, to the public. We will continue to share information as it becomes available to keep you informed about what is happening in our territory. If you are unsure, please check yukon.ca. With that, stay vigilant, Yukoners. We see the finish line, but we're not there yet. And as always, remember to be kind, patient, respectful, and excellent to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Premier Silver. Minister Frost. Uh, Jane Guinzi, um, Masicho, uh, to all of you for joining us today. 
Um, earlier this week, the first three Yukoners were immunized against COVID-19 in our uh, Whistle Bend long-term care facility. I must say, the stories told by these two residents about their past and why they were getting immunized humbled me. In spite of their age and what they have seen throughout their many years, they were amongst the first to raise their hands when the, when the vaccine was offered. One is 103, the other is 84. One survived the influenza of, of uh, early 1900s and the other survived uh, uh, the TB uh, outbreak in, at very early ages. So the, the stories they tell is, brings you to your knees and it brings you uh, to a humble place and realizing that um, they had no hesitation, no fear, just a desire to protect themselves and others around them. This was a, a selfless act. I was also proud to congratulate uh, June Car Carpina on being amongst the first Yukoners to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Mr. Carpina is one of the many talented frontline staff supporting our elders and seniors at Whistle Bend Place. Our elders and frontline staff are so brave and continue to lead the way in our fight against COVID-19. We all held out hope for, for a vaccine and this week, we have been able to begin less than 10 months after the first case arrived here in our territory. Since Monday, we have immunized 310 individuals, and I'm happy to say that there were no adverse reactions. By the end of this week, I understand from the staff, we will see an anticipated 500 um, individuals reached. Things are going well so far. We expect to immunize 100 uh, more residents and staff at long-term home care, uh, long-term care homes today as we continue to roll out the vaccines. I am happy and relieved to be able to share more details around the delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine into the waiting arms of Yukoners. We began this week with long-term care residents and staff and we will continue next week to visit our visit all your homes, including McDonald Lodge in Dawson City. We have been fortunate here in the Yukon that we have not faced the tragedies of other jurisdictions where long-term care homes have been ravaged by COVID-19. We have had no illnesses in our homes, either amongst residents or staff, and by beginning with immunizing our most vulnerable seniors and elders, we can keep it out. Beginning the week of January 18th, two mobile teams will begin traveling to rural Yukon communities to immunize all willing adults. Each team will travel with multiple immunizers so that teams can immunize as many people as possible while they are in each community. The first week, we will see teams travel south to Watson Lake, where they will also offer the immunization to residents of Lower Post and Upper Liard. The second team will travel to Beaver Creek and Oak Crow. During uh, details of times and locations will be available on the website as soon as locations are confirmed. Immunizations will be offered primarily through scheduled appointments, and there will be options for to book online or by the phone. These details will also be available early next week on yukon.ca. At the same time, our mobile teams will, are traveling. The Whitehorse team will open a mass clinic at the Whitehorse Convention Center. The initial priority will be high-risk healthcare staff, including First Nations healthcare workers and those working at the Whitehorse General Hospital. We need to work quickly to protect our frontline health care workers. At the same time, we will be immunizing our vulnerable and at-risk populations, including seniors. The clinic at the convention center will open six days a week, 12 hours a day, so that we can immunize as many Yukoners as possible. The following week, January 25th, we will be in Dawson City, Carcross, Teslin, and Pelly Crossing. The first week of February, we will see mobile teams travel to Burwash Landing, Destruction Bay, and Haynes Junction, Carmax, Faro, and Mayo. Our two mobile teams are named Balto and Togo, the two lead dogs who in 1925 led their teams from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska 
to deliver serum. Many of us may be familiar with the movie, but in actual fact, planes were grounded due to bad weather. Gnome had to run out of serum and it was up to the sled dogs to deliver 20 packages of medicine, 20 pounds. Now we have our own Balto and Togo delivering medicines to our communities. This has not been an easy task to organize and I want to thank all of the individuals involved. From the teams working on logistics to the training of our immunizers and transporters to all of our community partners who are helping to spread the message about the safety and importance of this new vaccine. Masi Cho to all of you. Our priority is to ensure we roll out the vaccine as quickly as we can while ensuring the safety of all Yukoners. The prioritization of vaccine rollout is based on the guidelines from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and recommendations from Dr. Hanley. These guidelines are based on protecting those who are most vulnerable. I want to be clear that the schedule rollout could change as we continue this important work. Rollout of the vaccine will take time and there are many logical detail, logistical details involved to ensure that we can immunize Yukoners as safely as possible. The rollout also depends on our supply of vaccine doses, which is the responsibility of the federal government. We are optimistic, and as I said, things are going well so far. In the coming months, all adult Yukoners will have the opportunity to receive immunization and help us and bring us one step closer to an ending the pandemic. In the coming weeks, you will be seeing and hearing a lot about the vaccine rollout. This will include details on when and where to get your shots, how to make the appointment, and why it's important for you to get immunized or to take your shot. We know that there are individuals out there who may be reluctant to get immunized, and we hope to provide the scientific background and information on an ongoing basis to help alleviate those fears. All vaccines go through a rigorous process at Health Canada that is known worldwide as the golden standard. In closing, I look back to the words of Agnes Mills, the Bantukwitchin elder, who was the first Yukoner to receive her immunization. She said she felt privileged. We are in a very good place, much better than other Canadians and others around the world. I want to say to our, our elder, Masi Cho, to Mary, Agnes and June, and everyone who, who chooses to get immunized. By getting immunized, you are choosing to protect yourself and everyone around you. Our teams will be extremely busy over the coming months after a very busy year, and I have to, to say thank you to them as well. Thank you for doing your part and working above and beyond to keep you, Connor, safe. We are in a very good place today because of the great work of our team at Health and Social Services, uh, Dr. Hanley and his team, and of course our health supports in our communities. I envy their stamina and appreciate their ongoing commitment to serving you, Connors. Hi, Cho. Thank you, Minister Frost. Dr. Hanley? Good afternoon, bon après-midi, and thank you to both Premier Silver and, and Minister Frost Masito. And thanks for that story about uh, Balto, which reminds me of reading that to my kids over and over as one of their favorite favorite stories. And, and what, what an appropriate name for uh, one of our um, skilled mobile teams to get out and deliver. I want to talk, uh, uh, give an overview of recent cases uh, today, both both possible and confirmed, and and uh, bring you up to date uh, with what we're seeing and what we expect to see in the coming weeks. Um, also, come back to a little bit about testing, um, and and to remind everyone of how important it is in these days to continue to be tested when appropriate. And uh, then I'll I'll land back to the vaccine uh, story. 
I do hope everyone was able to take some time over the holidays to, to rest and recharge a little bit. And I'm sure we're all probably happy to say goodbye to the old year and welcome in the new. Although there does seem to be lots of drama so far this year. 2020 was a year that's left its mark on all of us. Uh, a year of change, a year of sacrifice. But with that comes resilience and a chance for community togetherness that will ultimately be unbreakable. So I'm definitely proud to be part of this Yukon community coming into a new year. When it was necessary, we adapted and we selflessly altered our plans, our travel, our work to ensure that we protected this community we call home. And for that, I thank everyone and commend you for your efforts throughout this past year. COVID-19, however, was not ushered out with the old year, and it continues to be very much a part of our lives. Since January 1st, we've had nine new cases. All of these recent cases are in self-isolation, doing well, and all are based in Whitehorse. These cases were not a surprise to us, and to be honest, I will be surprised if we don't see more with individuals coming home for Christmas or other family members visiting, combined with the continued surge of cases down south, we anticipated that we would see more cases making their way into Yukon. These recent cases represent two separate clusters. The one cluster involves six of these cases, and most of these cases and their contacts have acted responsibly to protect the health of Yukoners, including self-isolating and following the safe six plus one. The other three cases are in a family group and both of these, uh, each of these um, clusters originated from travel outside of territory. And as I said, all are doing well isolating in their homes. We also have a possible case that has tested positive using rapid testing outside of Yukon. And in this situation, we act quickly to control potential disease while we await confirmation using one of our gold standard tests. And our contact tracing experts at YCDC determined that there were a number of potential contacts at indoor and outdoor social gatherings that were held over the holiday period. So we are in the process of following as contacts those who are identified as having attended these events. And we have 48 individuals, um, as we reported yesterday, currently self-isolating. Many of them have been tested. And meanwhile, we are awaiting confirmation imminently using the uh, gold standard test for the uh, individual that had a, a tentative positive. Now, there has been a lot of social media speculation around these cases, around who is partying or not, where these people were, what schools they attended, who brought in the infection in the first place. I need to remind people to trust the source of truth, in this case, us, public health, YCDC, myself and my office, and that we will tell you what you need to know to stay safe while we safeguard the confidentiality of, of the case and their families. And because of the nature of these social gatherings, and public health measures not always being followed, we did ask a large number of these contacts to self-isolate, as I said, and others um, having been asked to get tested. Now, many, many test results have already come in and, and are negative, and we are awaiting more. But this is really, the point of this was to allow us to identify any transmission of COVID-19 that may have occurred at these events, and of course, then to prevent onward transmission. And again, as I, I, I did say this yesterday, but I, I want to stress uh, again about the schools that um, among these, there were a few high school students um, identified, but we have no evidence of any exposure to COVID at any of the schools. And, and we have no COVID cases linked, linked to schools. So again, please continue to um, attend school as normally for, for students, continue to observe those public health measures that should now be daily routines for schools, including screening for illness before attending schools, using that traffic light guidance, following all of the safety precautions while at school, including mask use in those common areas and on the bus. 
So overall, this situation serves as yet another New Year's reminder that Yukoners are not immune to COVID, and neither are young people immune to COVID or its effects. And although largely a benign disease in young people, it can unpredictably cause severe disease or prolonged symptoms in anyone. Don't play Russian roulette with COVID-19. It's not worth it. And even if you do get over it quickly, your parents or grandparents or friends or colleagues may not fare as well. I hope these cases are a good reminder for us of how susceptible we still are to COVID, of how we all have a responsibility to behave responsibly. And that means behaving as if COVID-19 is in our midst, as it often is. Everyone must continue, as the Premier says, to follow the safe six plus one. <clears throat> so this is tough news to start the new year with especially as we had finished or almost finished 2020 with no active cases within Yukon. As cases surge around the country, we look out, though, from within, and it's e easy to get lured into complacency. And I, I think that may have happened yet again here. Sometimes we feel that we're so protected in our bubble that when a new case is confirmed, there's this shock that travels throughout the territory. And I urge you to recall when I've said previously that COVID-19 should always be assumed to be active here. Whether or not we have confirmed active cases, chances are it is lurking somewhere close. We can do everything in our power to avoid COVID-19, but we will not eradicate it from Yukon. So it's crucial that we remain on guard. If we don't, we do risk seeing an increase in cases as we get further into 2021 and even the risk for community transmission. That feels like an avoidable tragedy when we are so close to vaccine coverage. For those who are looking for guidance on when they should see seek testing, when to go to work, or when to self-isolate from others based on illness, I'd like to remind you to revisit the traffic light the traffic light checker that we developed on yukon.ca. And this guidance we developed to assist people who may be exhibiting symptoms and unsure of how to carry on with daily activities or, or whether to carry on. If you're experiencing new symptoms that appear without explanation, even if it feels similar to that annual flu or cold, the traffic light guidance informs you when you should seek testing and what activities you should be absenting from until symptoms resolve or until a test result confirms a negative result. We designed this really to be as practical as possible based on our, our risk environment, but to recognize that uh, testing is important. It remains important, and it's particularly important at this time of year. Uh, really, anyone with symptoms uh, needs to stay home and do that self-assessment to determine the need for testing. Well, Monday certainly was a red-letter day for the Territory as we began the rollout of the largest vaccine strategy to date in Yukon. And uh, as the Minister says, as of the end of yesterday, we had vaccinated more than 300 people in Whistle Bend Place, including uh, staff and residents here in Whitehorse. So we are enjoying this kind of new level of, uh, of, of excitement, but at the same time, it's, it's more important than ever not to jeopardize our community's safety or, or to begin taking public health measures lightly. Let's be clear, even when you receive your vaccine, public health measures will remain in place. We have to do the work, along with the rest of the world, to figure out when and how we can let go. While the immunization offers great protection against the virus, we don't have as yet a lot of information on how the vaccine prevents or limits transmission. We also don't know for sure that the vaccine prevents asymptomatic disease. So when you receive the vaccine, you must remain vigilant and actively follow the safe six plus one. Even though you may be immunized, if you choose not to follow public health measures, you could still put others not immunized at risk. I'm so pleased to be here with the Minister and the Premier as we share the plans for the COVID vaccine in Yukon. Another historic moment in Yukon is ours to live. And when it comes to vaccine, 
We're not going for the silver medal. We're going for gold. So remember, monitor your symptoms, and if you're sick, seek testing, and remember that COVID-19 is just as easy to contract as a common cold. We will be releasing more information over the coming weeks about public health measures and how that relates to vaccine, but vaccines do not yet alter our current need for public health measures, but that is a future we're all looking forward to. Always remember, safe six plus one, please use your mask. That's the best way to protect yourself from COVID-19. That's all for my update. Thank you, Masi Cho. Merci. Remember to take care of each other and stay well. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll go now to the phone lines, and if I could ask the reporters to identify which speaker you would like to respond to your question, that will allow our ASL translator to move back and forth so she can provide the, the information. We'll go first to Danielle from CBC. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Just barely. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, I guess this one is for the Premier. Um, you know, talking about rumor mills starting and whatnot, we're hearing that some parents, uh, with that letter that went out to students, some parents are saying they were aware of the exposure this weekend. So they're kind of wondering why the information came out on Wednesday. So I guess I'm just curious, when the government found out about the potential of exposure or the potential risk and why the notice was sent out on Wednesday. So again, um, <clears throat> we sent a letter out to support the, commu the school communities in addressing parents' concerns. Uh, many parents are, uh, are contacting schools and others uh, looking for information, and we want to reassure parents uh, that the process uh, with Yukon Communicable Disease Centre uh, and, uh, and what parents can do uh, on their part, so that conversation is happening. We also want to reiterate to parents uh, that those who were at risk were contacted uh, and will continue to be contacted if risk changes. Uh, if you were not contacted by YCDC, uh, then, then it's because your student was not identified as a, as a risk. So you can imagine as some of these conversations are happening with certain families, uh, you know, then all of a sudden conversations continue to happen uh, and rumors continue to happen as well. Um, I think uh, Minister Frost uh, was uh, in, in her opening comments today. Uh, spoke exactly to that as well, and making sure that you know we are communicating with the parents and the and the students uh, that we need to, but also knowing that you know a whole school doesn't necessarily get affected it because a student does. I think the uh, the schools have done a fantastic job of of working with inside the guidelines to make sure that individual students are staying within a cohort as much as possible when they're in schools as well. So I can't speak to as to. Um, how people heard things earlier than our announcements, but what I can say is that by, by monitoring how we get information out and the traceability uh, through YCDC, uh, they've been doing an, an impeccable job of, of working to make sure that Yukoners are being kept safe and that information is being shared at the same time, medical information that is personal and confidential uh, not being shared to those who don't need to have that information. Thank you, Premier Silver. Dr. Hanley? Thanks. I just wanted to add a couple of points. Um, I, I think this was, uh, again, a good reminder, uh, as the Premier said, of, of what processes we do have in, have in place. And, and really, the letter was about a non-exposure. So, so really, the letter was to describe that we, 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 do, we did not have a school exposure, um, but to really uh, try to reassure parents that if there is a, an exposure, we do have mechanisms for making sure that that, that uh, information is communicated appropriately, that people who need to know are informed, um, and uh, that uh, that we have we have. Um, worked out and practiced and, and rehearsed all of these protocols um, so that if there is an exposure, we have ways to, uh, to to deal with it and let people know when they need to know. So really, this was just a letter to reassure uh, sure parents because we had been learning of much uh, um, speculation uh, and, uh, and anxiety, and it really was designed uh, to, to reassure that, that we are able to carry on with school as, as normal. Thank you. 
Danielle, do you have another question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, on that, on that uh, note of making sure we don't dispel rumors, another one is that, you know, some of the students that could have potentially been exposed um, or the students being mentioned that had to self-isolate could have been at school for a few days before the letter came out. That's kind of a fear that we're hearing from parents. Can you speak to that a bit? Um, were these students ever at school after they had potentially been exposed? Yeah, it's a good thing to speak about. And, and again, we, we kind of address one layer at a time. So when if, if we were concerned enough that uh, a, a child might have been uh, symptomatic or, for instance, uh, at high risk of exposure, um, then we would take the appropriate precautions and, and do notifications. In this case, they were not, not necessary. This is a very, very low risk. Uh, the, the students were included among, among those 48. Uh, so it was three or four students students in that group of 48 who happen to be high school students who, as a precaution, because of a possible uh, a, a possible uh, infectious source who attended events. So so really, where we th this was almost like our public notifications. This was a, a precautionary notice to put people into self-isolation until we could get confirmation, um, as we are currently awaiting, of whether th this was a, a, a true positive or true case. And if there were um, if there were contacts that we could follow those people, if any of them developed symptoms, we could then do the appropriate notification um, and appropriate testing and notification back to the schools. So at this stage, it would have been inappropriate to provide any further. Um, uh, direction um, towards schools because we have no evidence of any exposure at the schools. So, uh, so, so yes, the the students transiently attended school, but that does not that that did not in, increase any risk of exposure. If one of those students, let's say, the case turned out to be positive, one of the students was uh, confirmed as a contact, developed symptoms, then we would go back and then do the appropriate contact tracing. Keep in mind that there is always a risk of COVID in our communities. There's always a risk in our schools. That is why we have the public health and safety measures in the schools. And that's why we can confidently continue to uh, be able to, um, to, to, in, to inform and, and, and encourage people to attend schools. We're always working in a COVID risk environment. One day we will get out of that environment and be able to return as we used to. But uh, that those measures that are in place are sufficient to allay that minimal risk that could have resulted in, in some kind of exposure at a school. Thank you. We'll move now to Luke from CKRW. I have a question for Minister Frost. Are we going to be seeing updated uh, statistics on vaccinations posted regularly to the website as far as amounts of people who have received their first and second doses and, uh, and the amount of uh, doses that we've received from Moderna? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, certainly, um, what we do want to uh, do is keep you, Connors, informed. So the data will be uh, shared uh, quite regularly, um, as we just did now. Um, we will continue to do that as we uh, bring the vaccines out into the communities as well. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Luke. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, there were. A lot, I know you did mention a lot of the dates as to when uh, when the communities were going to be getting these vaccines. I was just wondering if you could reiterate again when uh, when you expect the general public in Whitehorse to start uh, being able to receive their vaccines. Oh, thank you. Uh, great, great question. Um, so we we will uh, share the rollout plan with you. Uh, if it hasn't been already, we will share it with you shortly. So the expectation is that we will have the role, uh, the general public um, uh, and the clinic opened up in uh, Whitehorse on the beginning of the week of January 13th is my understanding. If that changes, we will certainly post it on yukon.ca. Uh, all of the information will be posted on, on the website. So encourage everyone to please go to the website for the most current detailed information. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim from Whitehorse Star. Yes, hello. All right, my first question is uh, for Minister Frost and uh, probably Dr. Hanley. 
uh, do you have any idea of when more of the vaccines are going to be available? Because currently you have enough to do 3,300 people with the two doses that they need. So are you just going to continue going with that amount till you run out? Or do you have an idea when more is coming? Uh, thank you. Um, really great question. And I think as you you will see in the um, vaccine plan, um, we have um, originally, I think the indication was we we're going to um, hold back and inoculate 3,600 people so that we get both doses. But at the moment, um, what's happening in other jurisdictions and what we've determined here in Yukon is we need to maximize and get, them, get all the vaccines out as soon as they arrive here. So um, we are now inoculating 7,200 Yukoners as per uh, what we have right now uh, on uh, next, uh, I believe it's a week of uh, January 18th, 24th, we will receive the next 7,200 uh, vaccines. And then in February, the anticipation is we will receive two more shipments in Yukon. Thank you. Premier Silk? Yeah, I, just a small bit to add from uh, from Minister Frost. <clears throat> there's, there's two variables that we're dealing with right now. It's One is up, uptick, uh, so how many Yukoners that we expect to get vaccinated based upon our scheduling, but also the uh, the, the doses from Ottawa. We do have a commitment from Ottawa that uh, within the first three months that 75% of our adult population will have the vaccines. Uh, the distribution of those uh, is still, uh, you know, we know uh, a couple of weeks in advance right now, and we're working on more details as to finalizing the scheduling of the, of the rest of those vaccines. So after uh, lots of conversations with Dr. Hanley and Minister Frost, you know, when we put one uh, vaccine into somebody's arm, you keep another, you know, and that's how we're moving forward right now and making sure that we have uh, that secondary vaccine for that individual. Uh, but again, there are variables out there that uh, we still don't know yet. As for example, if we head out to uh, a rural community and we expect X amount of vaccines to be given, and then we'll see uh, from there how many actually were uh, were taken, but also the uh, finalizing some of the end result uh, vaccines coming from Ottawa. So it, it's very difficult to to do a plan with those uh, unknowns, uh, and I have to give uh, tip my hat to Health and Social Services and and the team for 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 creating a schedule that builds in flexibility, and that's what we have right there. Uh, so we're having the flu clinic open up uh, for, for the vaccines, and we uh, designed a schedule together in a way that can be sped up uh, if needed uh, based upon uh, knowledge from Ottawa when our vaccines uh, are, are going to be arriving. Thank you. Do you have another question, Jim? Yes, I'm going to do a follow-up with the Premier on that, please. Um, you indicated and promised a number of times through the end of November and December that we wouldn't be getting the vaccine in dribs and drabs, yet that seems to be what's happening. How do you reconcile that? Well, I've said the whole time that I would like to see that. That's That was my recommendation from the get-go. I, I still am saying that it would be a lot more advantageous if we get it all in one foul swoop. Now, that didn't happen, uh, but we're still working with the federal government. I'm in on a call with the Council of the Federation and the First Minister's meeting today, and I'll continue to say we need to get these vaccines as quickly as possible. Uh, and now, uh, we definitely need to get them as quickly as possible because the government, the Health and Social Services Department, has proven its ability uh, to uh, quickly uh, train uh, and to quickly get uh, our, our priorities figured out and to have a schedule. So here we are ready, willing, and able, and we need to make sure that we have certainty from Ottawa as to when all of our doses are coming. Minister Frost. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the question, because I think it's one that we certainly need to reflect on as well. I mean, uh, what we indicated is that um, we we have a vision, and the vision is to have 75% of adult Yukoners over the age of 18 vaccinated by the end of March. That is our target, and the schedule allows us to do that. Built into that schedule is the flexibility to make adjustments so that we don't waste any of the vaccines that we use, maximize. Um, and, and, and another thing to reflect on, and Yukoners, you know, we're in a really great place and reflecting on Elder Mills' comments, um, you, we should be grateful. We should be grateful that we have received the vaccines we asked for within three months. Other jurisdictions, like British Columbia, for an example, that has the population base that they have, they only received 36,000 vaccines. Um, what we know is that... Um, 
as the rate is uh, being rolled out in, in, in Ontario, the anticipation is 5.5 years, right? That might not be factual as of uh, the coming days and weeks and months as vaccine comes available, but based on the first rollout. So just for reflection, I want to just say how privileged we are and how, honored, how, how, how I feel so honoured and humbled that we have an opportunity to protect you, Connors, by rolling out the vaccines as we are in such a short time frame. So thank you for the question. Thank you. We'll move now to John, CKRW. Hi. Uh, so I'm interested in, in, in learning more about the infector who uh, went from holiday gathering to holiday gathering. Um, I'm wondering if they were charged with failure to isolate because the understanding is that they knew they had COVID and still chose to go to these holiday events. Dr. Hanley? Yeah, so I, I think that's where we have to be very careful uh, about a few things. One is making conclusions based on uh, lack of information. Um, so uh, so a, a lot of what you said is actually not true. Uh, this person, for one thing, is not uh, an infector. Um, this is uh, someone who um, had, uh, yes, attended several gatherings. I don't know the details of each gathering, um, but uh, there may have been uh, some lapses in precautions at some of the gatherings that were attended based on what we've heard. Um, this was not an individual uh, who was supposed to be in uh, self-isolation. It's more of an individual that we think may have become um, infected at one of these gatherings. Therefore, uh, what we had was a potential exposure um, at uh, one of the one or more of these gatherings, and that is why we did the precautionary bubble, you might say, or umbrella of isolation around these 48 individuals until we could confirm or rule out um, infection in this individual and also look for any other uh, otherwise undetected uh, transmission um, by following anyone who develops symptoms and doing the testing. So, uh, so that's been our approach. I think we have to be very careful again about um, this is a combination of circumstances. Um, uh, uh, yes, there may have been some um, some transgressions, as it were, or, or the perhaps uh, the safety measures that we have been recommending uh, with uh, you know as much uh, um, as much force as we can. Sometimes um, sometimes there may have been lapses, but but I don't know that for sure. I do know that social gatherings are a risk, particularly indoor social gatherings, and thus the precautionary measures that we uh, that we took until we can confirm or rule out uh, uh, potential for transmission. Premier Silver. Yeah, thank you very much. And I not much, nothing more to add to that other than, uh, you know, we don't attach names to the to the charges. We have five new charges under SEMA. Three were for self-isolating, failure to self-isolate. Uh, one was for failure to behave in a manner consistent with a declaration. And one was failure to wear a mask. That brings our total charges up to 37. Uh, and the number of people that were charged is 30. Uh, and when Dr. Hanley talks about people gathering at parties over the holidays, um, I just again I hope the, that you realize the, the the results of your of your actions you know it's not worth it it absolutely isn't worth it um, you know young people uh, who who might feel that it's not going to affect them individually you might be right you might have a, a case where you get over it very quickly but you have the potential of causing serious harm to your community. Um, so the charges are one thing the harm to your community is really what people should be thinking about when they're gathering. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up John? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of hinging on something that Dr. Hanley said. You said that uh, you're not exactly aware of the details regarding uh, the, the holiday gatherings. Um, how can the government justify not having the details of these gatherings if there's been contact tracing from the possible exposure of these events? That's part of contact tracing to understand who was where and how much, uh, how many attendees were there were, and so on and so forth. How does that justifiable to say you don't know when that's the job? I'm going to have to break it to you that 
I don't know the details of every person that's contact tracing and where they've been and what they've been up to, but people do know. <laughs> and that's why we have a Yukon Communicable Disease Control. There are also details that we, we don't divulge for purposes of identifiability and protecting confidentiality. So what I usually work, what I work with when I work with uh, my colleagues in Communicable Disease Control is, is the bigger picture where, ident where we are identifying collectively based on individual questions and answers where risk where, where risk may have occurred. I must say that in this case, there was very diligent um, um, uh, uh, case finding and uh, contact tracing uh, with uh, fabulous participation from some of the families um, involved in these events. So, um, but, but nevertheless, you know what what we talked what we see are a number of gatherings. We, there was no. Uh, what large um, rave party or you know huge gathering that there, there was no real alarm bell from any particular event. It's just that we had an accumulation of gatherings where lapses may have have uh, have occurred, and without having kind of a surveillance camera at each of these, I'm, I'm not sure that we could identify every time that someone may have been uh, not socially distancing or not wearing a mask. So, I, so I want to just take this again a little bit of a, a higher level to uh, talk about where we see potential risk for transmission. That is our focus. Um, our focus is on uh, preventing, uh, identifying uh, infection, identifying risk for transmission, and preventing uh, on the potential for onward uh, transmission. That, that really is the focus. Thank you. We'll move now to Nick, Canadian Press. Hi, yeah, I'm just looking for a little bit of clarification on the vaccine rollout plan, uh, and apologies if it has been made clear before, but when um, when the government says that they're going to be vaccinating people, does that mean they're just giving them the first dose of the uh, vaccine? Mr. Frost? Thank you. Um, that That is correct. Um, so as we roll the plan out and we um, uh, go into the communities, I've indicated earlier in terms of the scheduling and the, how the schedule was uh, devised and uh, and the priority population base and how we were um, addressing that, particularly here in our large urban centre, given the uh, population base here in the city. Um, we, as we go out, we certainly want to make sure that we hit every possible person in all of our rural Yukon communities. So the criteria is a little different in terms of when we show up in in a community, uh, say like uh, Burwash Landing, for an example, right? Small community, you can inoculate everyone in your first. Uh, visit um, and then the the follow up for that. So we, we want to make sure as the plan is rolled out that we are following up with the second dose in in a way that is within the time frame allotted for uh, the second dose as defined by um, by the um, national standards organization. Thank you. Do you have a second question, Nick? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Dr. Henley. Yeah, I just going to follow up the minister's comments, uh, uh, agreeing with the minister. But but just uh, you know, the the goal is uh, two doses into every Yukoner that will come forward to accept vaccine. Our our, our kind of target is seventy five percent. That is two dose coverage um, by through through this first quarter um, up till the end of March, beginning of April. Thank you. We'll move now to Chris from CBC. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, question for uh, Dr. Hanley. I, I just want to go back to the to the school situation a little bit. Um, you mentioned that the three or four students who were possibly exposed uh, did attend school. Um, my question is, why were they allowed to go to school at all, and how can you say that allowing them to go to school doesn't increase the risk at school? <laughs> Yeah, just to be clear, um, ag again, um, and, and I think it should be largely reflected in the, in the letter, but um, 
the 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 identification and the, and the contact tracing occurred after after that fact. So by the time the self isolation order um, had was taking place, is when the the kids as soon as self isolation occurs, you do not go to school anymore. So so you know there's there's always a a lag. The kid the the kids don't necessarily know uh, automatically that they may have been uh, in um, exposed to a to a COVID transmission. That uh, that whole kind of investigation has to take place as soon as the notification occurred. Then and the self isolation writ dropped, as it were. Then they're out of school. Do you have a follow up, Chris? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess for Dr. Hanley or or, uh, or Minister Frost, whoever wants to uh, to answer that and. Um, uh, that is that, uh, as uh, Minister Frost mentioned, that we have not had any any cases uh, of COVID in our long term care homes, and I think we're all grateful for that. Um, but given that, uh, and given the fact that the places where we have had exposures have been airlines, uh, retail settings, was there any consideration given uh, to giving folks who work in those areas? Uh, getting them, I guess, on the list as as vulnerable populations. Yes, yeah, th thanks. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a good question, and, and I for for one thing, I'll come back to um, what the minister referred to as our um, our our privilege, and that that uh, and taking a slightly longer view of this, that we do have that uh, that privilege to be able to attain um, the, um, a high uptake, seventy five percent um, or, or potentially even higher um, by the by really three months from now um, into by the time we're into April, we we should have that um, that amount of coverage so that everyone has their chance and that is so different from um uh, anywhere in the world and uh, anywhere in the in the country apart from the other territories and even if we look around the world we look at Israel uh, who is widely lauded for their progress in vaccine their target is the same as ours so so we we have uh, uh, a target as aggressive as anywhere in the world at the moment and uh, I'm confident that we're going to get there so that I know that's not directly answering your question uh, I think we it comes back to that question of where will we have uh, risk and, and where are we going to see where where do we see the most the most risk and and it really comes down to uh, those priority populations that have been identified at national level but which are also very applicable to us so so we look at what what would be the consequences of an outbreak in in long term care and uh, uh, we know that that's where we have seen uh, high high infection rates, high mortality rates, and uh, real devastation. Um, and so um, where where we see, um, for instance, other priority populations, people who are who are marginalized, uh, people who are elderly, that's where we see res risk of severe outcomes. And then um, protecting our healthcare workers are uh, as a priority population um, uh, to be able to do to do their job, whether that's frontline in, in public health or, or in healthcare. So so there, I think I, I think we are very solid with our priority populations. Yes, there are these kind of exposure risks. Very few of them have actually resulted in any infection uh, in these public settings. But it does come back to all of the other measures that we need, including maintaining safe workplaces, um, having these uh, public health measures, including distancing and uh, mask use and sanitation and all of that. They're all layers. And now vaccine is our uh, ad additional layer that we're just bringing on. Thank you. We'll move now to Claudiane, Radio Canada. Oui, pour le docteur Henley, euh, j'ai un million de questions, mais on va s'en tenir à deux. Euh, donc, la vaccination débute mi-janvier pour la population générale avec en priorité les travailleurs de la santé. Ma question, donc, juste pour confirmer que j'ai bien mes faits comme il faut, est est-ce que les travailleurs de la santé sont obligés de recevoir le vaccin s'ils ont eux-mêmes des préoccupations? Est-ce qu'ils sont obligés de le recevoir? So the question is for Dr. Hanley. Uh, in mid-January, we will start having vaccination, and one of the priority population is health uh, healthcare workers. Um, 
Are the healthcare workers? Ich muss kurz klären, ich habe den Rest. Oh yeah, are they going to be? Yeah, are they going to be uh, uh, obliged to to get the vaccine to be able to keep working? Uh, no. Uh, il n'y aurait pas un une projet de loi ou une obligation uh, pour les travailleurs, uh, mais je, je pense, uh, j'ai entendu uh, qu'il y a beaucoup d'intérêt uh, de, 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 de venir, d'avancer pour, pour cette, uh, ce vaccin-là. Et, on, et on, on va suivre, on va encourager, on va, on va appliquer toutes les mesures d'encouragement, d'éducation pour encourager uh, le, uh, les gens. Et jusqu'au maintenant, la réception est très bon, euh, est très bon pour euh, pour recevoir euh, le, le, le vaccin. Euh, ce qui l'a beaucoup aidé aussi, on a des conversations individuelles avec chaque personnel, et je pense c'est un moyen pour euh, pour avoir toutes les toutes les doutes s'il y en a, toutes les questions. Euh, poser son euh, d'avoir une chance pour parler de toutes les toutes les questions de chaque individuel pour avoir le, le, pro, le un bon process pour pour bien comprendre euh, le valeur et, et le risque de recevoir un vaccin donc je pense c'est le euh, pour le moment c'est euh, c'est le modèle qui qui marche très bien pour une bonne réception de vaccins chez les personnels do you want me to translate that? Yes, one? please. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, the question was about really a man. Is there any mandatory um, uh, policy uh, for healthcare workers to receive vac vaccine? Uh, no, we have not had that for influenza vaccine. We we don't. Uh, we are not entertaining that for uh, at this point uh, for COVID nineteen vaccine. I, I will say. We have so far uh, very good uptake um, um, among the personnel so far at, at long-term care. And I think what's really helping, uh, w what I'm hearing is tremendous enthusiasm amongst our healthcare workers. Uh, they can't wait, just like the Premier, um, and uh, me, me neither. Um, but that's not my turn yet. Um, but uh, really a lot of enthusiasm. But what, what, what I think is very... Um, uh, very cool about this current process is that each each staff person that has come forward has had a chance to have a conversation with uh, w with a vaccinator or with a with a management with someone who's skilled in being able to answer questions to talk about the vaccine and so those individual conversations I think have really helped people to feel comfortable and confident uh, taking a vaccine and um, we are seeing very good uptake at the moment. Thank you. Have you another question, Claudian? Oui, merci. Euh, donc, considérant qu'on a un montant limité de vaccins dans un premier temps, euh, quand est-ce que, ben, quand est-ce que vous, le Premier ministre, ou euh, you connais moyen, va pouvoir obtenir le vaccin? So, given that we have this limited uh, quantity of vaccines available, when is the average Yukoner uh, be able to get vaccinated? So I, I think Minister Frost dealt with that very well in talking about uh, when they're coming out. Uh, you know, again, uh, if you don't already have the information, Gladiana, as far as the scheduling that we have, that will be provided today. Uh, and again, we spoke uh, about the flexibility of the plan. Um, you know, if we uh, get more information from the feds on uh, on the full distribution cycle, that will affect uh, our vaccinations. Right now, we are making sure that uh, we're rolling out the 7,200 that we do have, uh, knowing very well that uh, we're expecting another uh, round of 72 uh, two weeks per, uh, in two-week increments from the first uh, shipment, uh, but there is still more details from Ottawa. And so uh, uptick on the on the each week uh, and how many Yukoners get vaccinated, but also finalization of the commitment uh, from Ottawa to make sure that within the first quarter of the 2021, we will have enough vaccines to immunize 75% uh, of our adult population. Uh, the details as to when the all the full shipment of all those first and second doses, we don't have that information from Ottawa yet, but right after this meeting, that's exactly what I'll be talking to the Prime Minister about. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Marine Roboreal. Merci. Um, ma, 
première question est euh, l'objectif est de, so de vacciner 75 de la population, euh, mais comme le docteur Anne vient de le mentionner, ce n'est pas un vaccin obligatoire. Qu'est-ce qui arrive si euh, au mois de mars la, on n'atteint pas cet objectif si le 75 n'est pas atteint? So the objective is uh, to immunize 75% of the population. Um, given that the vaccine is not mandatory, uh, what is uh, your plans if we have less than 75% of people wanting to be immunized? C'est euh, oui, on a on a plein de questions pour pour le futur um, et um, et les mesures publiques par exemple uh, vont dépendre certainement sur le um, uh, sur le, sur la proportion de personnes uh, qui, qui ont um, qui ont reçu le vaccin. On va continuer d'avoir le, le vaccin disponible. Uh, c'est c'est pas que c'est fermé après le, le fin de mars. Uh, donc on va continuer à avoir uh, et et aussi j'espère produire uh, peut-être les autres produits. Uh, si par exemple il y a des certaines personnes qui qui peuvent pas recevoir le Moderna, on a dans le futur autres produits disponibles. Donc, on va continuer à évaluer et avoir aussi euh, mieux de connaissances sur les conséquences d'avoir un certain pourcentage. Par exemple, c'est possible qu'avec même 50% de la population euh, vaccinée, ça va, ça va être suffisant pour euh, empêcher la circulation de COVID. Donc, à ce moment, c'est une estimation, euh, mais ça va changer ou plus haut ou, ou plus bas. Donc, il y a, il y a beaucoup de questions euh, toujours à euh, à, à se poser, à, à être répondu. Mais pour le moment, c'est un but. On, 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 va, on va dépenser toute l'énergie pour atteindre euh, cet but d'avoir euh, euh, au moins 75 de la population à l'huile vaccinée. Et puis, euh, on va réévaluer euh, ici à fin de mars pour le, les prochaines étapes. I'll just uh, translate that one too. Uh, what if we don't get there uh, is the question. What if we don't get to 75%? So I, I've said a, a few things. One is we're going to learn a lot more about this vaccine as we go in terms of what does it mean to be covered at 75%? What does it mean to be at 50%? What, uh, what, how much do you actually need to prevent circulation of, of COVID or to minimize the impact of COVID in the community? And therefore, how can you adjust your public health measures and gradually lift? We also, uh, it's not that there's a hard stop the end of March. Maybe there'll be certain uh, other products of vaccine that we'll have available that will be suitable for people who couldn't uh, get the Moderna. Um, maybe there'll be people that, for whatever reason, uh, need more time and need another chance, and we will continue to offer, to encourage, to educate, um, and adjust our goals as we get more information. Maybe we need a higher goal. Maybe it'll be a lower goal. Um, but but really, it's a it's a whole kind of program and progr in progress uh, based on uh, evidence that evolves as we go, such as the life of a pandemic. Um, what, uh, um, what uh, for now, though, that what we're putting all our energy into getting to that goal, and our goal is 75% um, aiming for the end of March. Thank you. Premier Silver? Just add a little clarity to where did the number 75% come from to begin with? Uh, that came from the federal government making their best estimates on willingness in in uh, in populations. Uh, we were told from the beginning if if we thought 100% of the population was going to get the vaccine, then we would give you that 100%. But the best science and the best data and statistics at the time from polling was that a good estimate is that 75% of the population will be ready, willing, and able to get the vaccine. But again, as Dr. Hanley says, you know, we are going to be making adjustments as we go and our goal is as many as possible. Thank you. And? and okay, now it's coming on. And I would just add that 75% happens to correspond with an initial estimate of 
uh, herd immunity coverage, but it is a very rough estimate, and it could be 60%, it could be 90%, but, but it does give us uh, n not only the estimated uptake, but, but a reasonable goal to begin with. Thank you. Avez-vous une autre question, Marianne? Oui, merci. Est-ce que l'implantation du de, de cette stratégie de, de vaccination va avoir un impact sur euh, la réouverture ou pas des frontières du territoire avec le reste du Canada ou avec euh, les frontières internationales? Will have an impact on uh, when the borders can be opened with other provinces or with uh, internationally? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I think I think Dr. Hanley uh, said it very eloquently earlier. This is another tool in our toolbox. Uh, you know, it, this we'll see how this planks the curve. And uh, previous to the uh, vaccine, we saw what measures in the summer allowed us to uh, move forward through our plan, which is available on yukon.ca, uh, that triggers us forward or backwards through that plan. Uh, we're now in that final stage where we have a vaccine and we're put and we're starting that process. Uh, but again, whether it's uh, maintaining the safe six, uh, you know, washing your hands, being vaccinated, all of these are tools in our toolbox and we're cautious, cautiously optimistic on the, the next few weeks and months of us being able to get more to a sense of, of, uh, of normal. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's, it's too early for us to say that uh, at a certain time we're going to be able to start lifting restrictions, but, uh, you know, this is, this is definitely uh, a good sign. Uh, as Minister Frost said as well, we, we are in a very enviable position right now uh, from other jurisdictions. Uh, there's some more information to come as far as when the complete rollout of all of our vaccines, when the distribution starts uh, or continues. But with that being said, uh, cautiously optimistic, and I know talking to the premiers right across Canada, we know that this will cause uh, a, a reduction in in the cases, and uh, we're very we can't wait to start, start seeing the trends in epidemiology going into a, a direction that allows us to open up more to uh, to other jurisdictions. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Je vais pas traduire, mais je vais ajouter. Uh, I, I, I won't translate all that. I'll just add to that. Uh, but before I add to that, to that, it reminds me of a very uh, sweet uh, email I had just a few days ago. And the email was from British Columbia. And British Columbia was saying how good she had been and could she come back into our bubble. And uh, I, I think we have to say, uh, not yet, <laughs> but vaccine will help. Uh, donc, c'est une question mondiale. C'est une question qui, qui est sur, uh, ben, sur la table um, dans, dans tout le monde. Donc, on va avec, uh, uh, avec tous les experts globaux. Uh, um, on, on espère d'être dans une position d'examiner l'impact du vaccin sur la, la capacité d'ouvrir les, les frontières ou, ou internationales ou domestiques. Donc, uh, une question, uh, une bonne question à suivre. Thank you. We'll move now to Haley, Yukon News. Thanks. Um, my first question, I think, was a clarification. I'm not sure if it was answered, but any of the new charges laid under SEMA since the new year, are any of those directly related to the two outbreaks and the potential third one? So again, we don't connect together those dots necessarily, um, but uh, just to report you know, that there are five new charges. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question, um, probably for Minister Frost, was about um, outreach as far as the vaccine schedule. I've gotten some calls from people who are concerned that they live very remotely, they don't have great internet access. Are there any outreach efforts that aren't going to be um, just posting information online or a number you can call? Well, thank you. Uh, really um, great uh, question. Um, we have, of course, our uh, demographic makeup and our location uh, requires us to take many approaches in how we communicate. So we will use the radio, we will use in uh, social media, uh, newspapers, whatever means is necessary. Um, we're working very, very closely with our mayors and councils as well uh, to, and of course, our First Nations to find out who is off grid and how do we get to the individual that are off grid so that we they can essentially um, get vaccinated. So we are taking every possible measure. So thank you for the question. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Our next COVID-19 update will be Wednesday, January 13th at 1.30 p.m.